In this lesson, we're going to look at cells. The first aim is to compare the structure of animal, plant, and bacteria cells, then describe the function of key organelles, and then finally compare the use of the light and electron microscope. Now, I'm sure you're aware by now that the cell is the most simple, basic building block of life. Some cells do everything a living thing needs, whereas others are specialised, where they've evolved to excel at performing specific functions, such as nerve cells and red blood cells. But this got me thinking a few years back, and I thought it would be an interesting way to start the lesson. What is death? You see, when an animal such as ourselves die, we have an understanding of what that means. But when you actually think about it, it's quite a hard thing to define. Because if you look at the cells that make up an organism, after it dies, many of the cells are still active. At least for a little while. Take a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, so I'm sure you've seen these before, these are chrysalis. During this transformation, any recognisable form of a caterpillar will have gone. Instead, you get this brief period of a complete mush of cells. Nothing that you would technically call a living organism. Yet the cells are very much alive. So I guess what death means is our cells have lost the ability to communicate with each other. Meaning a body as a whole has lost the ability to function properly. One thing's for certain though. The inner workings of a cell is a universe unto itself. More complicated than a thoroughly detailed account of the most accomplished of human life. So there are three kinds of cells you need to be aware of, animal cells, plant cells, and bacteria cells. This Venn diagram is an excellent way of comparing the key features of each type of cell, and this could be the basis of an extended question. The interesting thing here is that animal cells don't have any features which are unique to themselves. In fact, at GCSE, an animal cell isn't significantly more complicated than what you learn in year seven. You have a nucleus, you have mitochondria, you have a cell membrane, cytoplasm, and ribosomes. I'll explain their specific function in a bit. Plant cells have all those things, but also they have a cell wall, and unique to plant cells alone, we have a large vacuole, this large space in the center, and chloroplasts, which contain chlorophyll for photosynthesis. Bacteria cells have a cell membrane, cytoplasm, ribosomes, but no nucleus, and no mitochondria, and no chloroplasts. You see, this is your nucleus, these are chloroplasts, these are mitochondria. These three things share something in common. They all have a double membrane, and bacteria do not have any membrane-bound organelles. Organelles are simple parts of cells that when you put together, you make an entire cell. So all the things I'm listing here are organelles. There you have it, in case you're wondering how it's spelt. You see, membrane-bound organelles developed far later in the evolutionary timeline. Bacteria have been around significantly longer than these cells. These are called eukaryotic cells because they have a nucleus. Whereas bacteria are prokaryotic cells. Pro means before the nucleus, karyo meaning the nucleus, and eu meaning true nucleus, so eukaryotic, prokaryotic. So bacteria also have a cell wall, like plant cells. But specific to bacteria, you have circular chromosomal DNA. In other words, a massive loop of DNA where chromosomes are stitched end to end. You have a flagellum. That's a tail-like structure used for locomotion. It comes from the word flagellate, which means to whip. You have plasmids. Plasmids are tiny loops of extra DNA. And you have pili. Pili are delicate tube-like extensions. Bacteria use these to transfer genetic information to other cells. So in an exam question, if you were asked to compare the structure of these cells, you would phrase your answer as follows. All three types of cells have a cell membrane, cytoplasm, and ribosomes. Only animal and plant cells contain a nucleus and mitochondria, and only bacteria and plant cells contain a cell wall. Only plant cells have a large vacuole and chloroplasts, and only bacteria cells have circular chromosomal DNA, a flagellum, plasmids, and pili. Just a simple exercise in memory. So that is how we compare the structure of animal, plant, and bacteria cells. Now let's explore the function of these organelles. Well, the nucleus, which I'm sure you've heard of, contains genetic information in the form of DNA, and that controls what the cell does, the activity of the cell. So whether the cell needs to divide or whether the cell needs to construct proteins, even if a cell needs to undergo a process called apoptosis, where it literally kills itself, all this is controlled by the nucleus. The cell membrane is a thin barrier made from lipids, fat molecules. 
And this is handy because fats don't mix with water, so it ensures that water doesn't freely enter the cell, causing it to burst. In other words, it separates the contents of the cell from its environment, giving it some degree of control. So cell membranes control what enters and leaves the cell. The cytoplasm, which like the cell membrane you'll find in every type of cell, is a jelly-like fluid for transport, and it's where many chemical reactions take place. For example, glycolysis, which is a really important part of respiration. Ribosomes are these tiny yellow circles I've drawn here. You will find these in all cells as well. Their function is to make proteins. I go into a lot more detail about their function in the tutorial on protein synthesis. Finally, you have the cell's battery, the mitochondria. This is where aerobic respiration takes place, which releases energy which the cell can put to good use. There's strong evidence to tell us that mitochondria used to be their own living thing. At some point in evolutionary history, a larger cell, we believe, engulfed the mitochondria. And rather than digesting it, the cell enjoyed the benefits that the mitochondria brought with it. In other words, the ability to kick out lots of energy which the cell can use. If it wasn't for this symbiotic relationship, complex life as we know it probably would not have evolved. We know that mitochondria are their own living thing because they bring with them their own DNA. And interestingly, all the mitochondrial DNA in your body has come from your mother. And that's because when the sperm fertilizes the egg, the sperm section which contains all the mitochondria drops off and never actually enters the cell. So all the mitochondria actually is contained within the egg cell, which you are made from through cell division. Because of this, we can trace all mitochondrial DNA back down to one single female who gave rise to the human race. We call her mitochondrial Eve. Plant cells also have a nucleus, ribosomes, mitochondria, and cytoplasm, and a cell membrane. The function is exactly the same as you would expect in animal cells. Unique to plant cells are chloroplasts. Think of them like cousins of the mitochondria, which is why they look fairly similar. They contain a green pigment called chlorophyll, and that's where photosynthesis occurs, that life-giving chemical reaction that produces sugars from sunlight and sustain almost every food chain known to mankind. For your exams, make sure you remember the function of chloroplasts and mitochondria, in that mitochondria are the site of respiration and chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis. This fluid-filled space here is called a vacuole, or a large vacuole. And that's because in certain other things like bacteria, you can get small vacuoles, which eject excess water to stop the bacteria bursting. The large vacuole, however, contains sap in the form of a sugar and salt solution. The vacuole works in conjunction with the cell wall. The cell wall is made of cellulose, a tough fibrous material that gives the cell mechanical strength. What happens is the vacuole will fill with water and it'll pump up like a tire. This will then push against the cell wall, which pushes back to give the cell shape. So the vacuole with the cell wall give the cell support. We don't need a system like this because we have bones to form our skeletons to give us support. Plants don't have skeletons. They require this system to give them support. That's why if you don't water a plant, it starts to droop, which means its leaves don't face the sunlight, so they can't photosynthesize, so the plant dies. So remember to always water your plants. If you want to try a little experiment at home, get a carrot, put it in the freezer, and then next day take it out and let it thaw. Once the ice is melted, you'll realize that the carrot becomes really bendy. And that's because the water inside the cell has expanded as it freezes, and it punctures the cell wall, breaking it. As a result, the plant cells no longer have support, so the carrot becomes bendy. Give it a try. Whereas something like a steak is always bendy, because there are no cell walls to start off with. Bacteria cells also have cytoplasm, cell wall, like plants, cell membrane, and ribosomes, which again have the same function as I've already discussed. Unique to bacteria is circular chromosomal DNA, which is a large loop of DNA which controls cell activity. So this is where you'll find the genes. But plasmids are also found in bacteria cells, and these are small loops of extra DNA. Genetic engineers find this loop really, really convenient. Because of its small, manageable size, we can tamper around with it, insert genes, and make the bacteria make things that are useful to us, like insulin. This is where you'll find genes for something like antibiotic resistance. For more on plasmids, watch the tutorial on genetic engineering. The flagellum is a tail-like structure that rotates around and around like a motor, to propel the cell forward, so it allows the cell to move. 
And the pili, as I've already discussed, are used for lateral gene transfer. So bacteria have the ability to exchange things like their plasmids between each other through their pili. This is why antibiotic resistance can spread so quickly in bacteria. The key organelles I'd commit to memory are the nucleus, mitochondria, ribosomes, chloroplasts, the vacuole and cell wall relationship, plasmids, flagellum, and circular chromosomal DNA. The rest is less likely to come up. And that is how we describe the function of key organelles. So now let's look at microscopes. You see, there was a time when we believed what we saw was all that there was. That was until a scientist called Leeuwenhoek in the late 1500s developed the first light microscope. It didn't look anything like the microscopes you use in a school lab. It looked a bit more like a Kinder Egg toy you could attach onto a keychain. But he was a master lens craftsman. Even by today's standards, people find it very hard to compete with his skill. He famously examined a sample of pond water under his microscope. And to his shock and amazement, he found little things moving invisible to the naked eye. He had discovered an entirely new world of living organisms that we had no idea existed. And if you think about it, it massively helped our understanding of infectious diseases. So there are two types of microscopes you need to be aware of, the light microscope which you use in a school lab and the electron microscope which I doubt you'd ever see in a school lab because they're so expensive. You can see the electron microscope was developed about 350 years after the light microscope. So a light microscope has a few key parts you need to be aware of. You have an eyepiece lens which magnifies the specimen by 10 times the size. You then have the objective lens wheel over here which I'm sure you're used to. You can spin it around to change different lenses which offer different magnification. In a school lab commonly you have times 10 or times 20 or times 40. So you have to take both these into account when working out how much bigger the image is than the real thing. You're looking at. So if you had the objective lens at times 10 then the image would be 100 times bigger because you do 10 times 10. If you're looking at it through times 20 then it'd be 200 times bigger, 20 times 10. And times 40 would be 400 times bigger because you do 40 times 10. You have a stage where you put the specimen on where it performs for you so to speak. You have the focusing wheel which basically sharpens the image and you have your light source which enables you to see it. That's why it's called a light microscope. Sometimes you have mirrors here to reflect natural light. Here's some typical images of things you might see under a light microscope. Yeah, I've got some plant cells and you can see chloroplasts there. And here I've basically coated the underside of a leaf with nail varnish, let it dry and then peeled it off using sellotape. And what you're seeing here is just the nail varnish cast of the underside of a plant. And here you can see the stomata, the tiny pores on the underside of a plant that allow for gas exchange. An electron microscope is much bigger. It doesn't use light, it actually uses electrons to produce its image. Because electrons are much smaller than the wavelength of visible light. It allows for much higher resolution images to be created. For example, you can see pollen grains here. You can see red blood cells and white blood cells here. This is an artificially colored image of salmonella bacteria that gives you food poisoning. And this is a tiny mite which has been magnified significantly. Both microscopes have helped us develop the field of cellular biology. They've enabled us to see structures we never knew existed and helped develop our understanding of how cells work. With light microscopes, you can see things like nuclei, chloroplasts, and mitochondria, and they can magnify images up to 4,000 times. Electron microscopes, you can see images in much more detail. You can see the internal structure of mitochondria and chloroplasts, and you can also see plasmids. So without electron microscopes, genetic engineering would still be in the dark ages. They can magnify images by 300,000 times. Make sure you know the different things you can see through each type of microscope. The last thing you need to be able to do is perform simple magnification calculations. Now, I'm not a big fan of triangles, but on this one occasion, I'm gonna make an exception. And that's because unlike in physics, this is the only triangle you need to remember. I think for once, using a triangle actually makes it easier to remember. So just remember, old man's ankle, O-M-A. In this triangle, the horizontal line is a divide line and this vertical line is a multiplication line. How it works is if you wanted to work out, let's say magnification, you'd cover that and what you'd be left with is observed divided by actual. If you wanted to work out the actual size, you would cover A and you'd have observed divided by magnification. And if you wanted to work out the observed size, you'd cover O and you'd have magnification times actual size. So what do I actually mean by observed and actual? 
well observed is how large the specimen appears under the microscope. So look at this mite. Let's say it appears to be 100 millimeters in length. Stick to the unit millimeters for this. Although an A-level biologist would tell you stick to micrometers, which is a thousandth of a millimeter. The actual size tells you how big the specimen really is. So if we zoom in here, we can see that this mite is actually 0.05 millimeters in length. And finally, the magnification tells us how much the microscope has enlarged the actual specimen size by. So let's give one calculation a go. If an image under a microscope appears to be 100 millimeters in length, and the actual length of the specimen is 0.05 millimeters, what is the magnification? Well, we want to work out magnification, so let's cover magnification and we have observed length divided by actual length. They're both in millimeters, so we don't have to do any unit conversion. So we do 100 divided by 0.05, and that gives us a magnification of 2000. So this image is 2000 times larger than the actual specimen length. So that is how we compare the use of light and electron microscopes.